A warm welcome to this British Chamber of Commerce webinar on navigating the media. I am John Dawson, the founder and the CEO of Reputation Management Consultancy, Akara Strategy, former Bloomberg TV anchor, and a proud member of Brit Chamber's Marketing and Communications Committee. Now, with this panel, we hope to demystify and ease your concerns and fears of engaging with the media, offer guidance on how to pitch, assess the future media landscape, and reassure you why journalists are not your enemy, always. Either way, business, whether C-suite or the PR handling the media, can often be nervous, whether being quoted out of context or being caught up in the backdraft of a sensitive issue that can quickly balloon to a crisis. And of course, damage your brand almost permanently sometimes, corporate or indeed personal. I'm very excited today to welcome to the screen three, not one, not two, but three award-winning journalists at the top of their, their game, who broadcast, write, and produce content across all the media platforms. Manisha Tank is an anchor, radio, and podcast host, and C-suite presenting coach, and last week was the host of Singapore successful and sold out and in-person FinTech Festival. Stephen Shah is Singapore's most recognizable face as the lead anchor and senior editor on Channel News Asia's for the, well, for the past 17 years, and Shipping Lo wears both hats, journalist and communications, she is a feature writer, editor, published author recently, content strategist, and has had senior roles in public relations. Now, now, before I start, this will be an interactive session. So if you would like to ask the speakers a question or two or three, please post using the Q&A box on your Zoom toolbar. I will do my very best to ensure that all the panel has the chance to answer them all. We will have 50 minutes towards the end for Q&A. This session will also be available on our on-demand section of the website and social channels, so if you would like to watch the webinar again, you certainly can. Also, a very special thank you, if I can, to big thank you to Lucy Hayden and also Catherine Mo from Britcham Singapore, who have worked incredibly hard to help organize this event. They've been absolutely fantastic. And without them, we wouldn't be here. It's as simple as that. So let's go to the straight to the panel. And to begin, I gave a quick headline on, on our speakers. Not enough, I must say. I want to ask them to introduce themselves, if I can and briefly assess the rapidly evolving and changing media landscape. From a business perspective, I would say, trying to figure out the most effective and impactful platform can be quite overwhelming. One size does not always fit all. Manisha, you've just been at the FinTech Festival. What trends did you see? What excites you? You've been covering your podcast, anchoring, writing, you name it. So now what are you seeing for the future five to 10 years? And welcome all. Well. <laughs> uh, I think it's sort of all guns blazing, really. Um, now you have, as you were saying, just so much more choice than ever before. Let me talk about the FinTech Festival. Um, I mean, it was huge. We're calling it, it wasn't the biggest in the world, but we are calling it the most impactful FinTech Festival in the world. And what was really interesting about it was the FinTech Festival itself had an event, had a big stage, it had multiple stages, but then it had an app. So, so here we already have two platforms. We're reaching people from the event space, which before we might not have thought of as a media platform, but let me tell you, my experience through this is actually, it really did feel like one. And this is a way that many businesses, organizations got involved and were able to spread their messages, their key messages and share a call to action. Then you have the app, people working through the app, again, sharing ideas, there's thought leadership, all that sort of thing. Um, and then you have people who are networking as well. And while we were there, of course, my contemporaries on the panel will, will understand this. You had all of the major media organizations represented. So CNA were there, Bloomberg were there, CNBC were there. You know, it's bringing all of these different organizations together. So it really was firing on all cylinders. And then of course, hashtag SFF 2022. So everyone is putting out this media, they're putting out these thoughts, they're sharing all these pictures on all of the social media channels. So if ever there was an example of how you can blast on many media platforms at once, a huge event like that is a great example of it. But really digging into your question, something else I wanna say is for me, audio is just huge right now. I spent some time hosting radio here in Singapore and since then have been podcasting. Podcasting is exploding. Perhaps we can talk about it later. Yeah. I wonder to what extent that's gonna continue. Um, and in fact, I was just reading today that Spotify is now expecting audiobooks to be the next frontier. So, you know, that your PR might be calling on you as a CEO now to say, well, the next thing is for you to write a book and for us to have it narrated and it should be out there on Spotify. So we're just getting so many opportunities to communicate. Uh, and you're quite right. No, no one 
paradigm fits all, but there's just so much choice out there right now. It's really what works for you is best. So yeah, I think that's where I am with it. Just a multitude of things to choose from. It's a time to educate ourselves as to how we want to communicate best. Can I ask this one though? What is the most impactful in terms of, you know, driving visibility, do you think? Or is it just different? You can't really pick one. I think it's just different. I think it's just different. You know, I came from a broadcast, as you know, I came from a broadcast background, John. And obviously, if you want to reach, reach hundreds of millions of people, you still want to be seen on CNBC, Bloomberg, whatever it might be, CNN. Uh, but getting, getting yourself in that position, it's a journey. Now, some people get lucky and it, and it will happen and those organizations will come searching for them and say, yeah, you know, we want to comment from you. We think that you have a voice in this space or, you know, you've established yourself as a thought leader in this space. Sometimes the story merits those organizations reaching out to you, but it's a journey to get there. And I think it's very important to be cognizant of all of the rungs on that ladder to get you to that stage where you are reaching those hundreds of millions. But it really just depends on your key messages. It really depends on your strategy and what you're looking for, what your mission is. I say this to clients all the time. What's your actual mission? Some of them think that the most exciting thing in the world is to be on every newspaper, in every newspaper and on every channel. But does that really achieve the result that you're looking for? That really just depends on your mission. I'm bringing Stephen now. So Stephen, uh, 17 years as the anchor of Singapore's, well, I, I said most recognizable face. I mean, have you, how have you seen that, that? Obviously, it's significant changes in the last 17 years. But what are you seeing now in terms of trends that you feel that maybe in Singapore, particularly for the kind of business community, that could be quite impactful? I think I'll add on to what uh, Manisha said. I mean, it's I don't think it's about one or two significant changes, but it, you know, the whole the whole world has changed and the way we live has changed, the way we play, the way we work, everything has changed. So as a result of that, what we're doing in the industry is also reflective of what is happening in our real lives. And and that's very important because I guess, I guess if we have a messaging and content, but if it doesn't resonate with the audience, then it's, it's kind of useless. Uh, but same time, using all the platforms, I mean, we've moved into digital in a big way because we realized that TV is... Um, well, my opinion is that TV will always exist, but it's not the the the, the key tool anymore. You used to, uh, when you hear about something happening, a plane crash, you would go find a TV and switch it on to see what's happening. You don't have to do that anymore. Everything comes in on your phone. In fact, by the time you watch TV, the news is outdated. So we realize that there's an entire plethora of all the different social media platforms plus TV. And I think you need to use each of those tools in uh, in unity. So. There's no point being big on one because, it, I mean, and also depends on who you want to reach out to, but very much so, I think a, a lot of the younger demographic today turn to social media first before they turn to traditional platforms like TV or newspapers. In fact, I have to admit about two years ago, I stopped subscribing to the physical paper because I was like, this is all news. Everything I'm reading happened yesterday. You know, so it wasn't, uh, for me, it was pointless. I, I would get everything online and I'd rather do that. Uh, but, and I, I know people who don't even have a TV in their homes anymore because everything's streamed, everything's online as well. So I think that is a big change in the way we relate to them. And I think businesses will find it hard, but they need to kind of jump on that bandwagon. It's just that, how do you jump on it? At which point do you jump on and which are the ones you really want to cling on to? That uh, really depends on what you want to achieve. And how has how the kind of media, if you like, overload affected Singapore? Obviously, in, in Singapore, it's the straight, Singapore Business Times and yourselves. So obviously, mm -hmm. the three, I mean, have you, have you, you mentioned move to online. Have you therefore been catching up in Singapore or is it perhaps a still a foot in the past, but really an accelerating foot to, towards the future? Well, it's a bit of both, but I mean, we, we understand that our demographic is mainly people who live in Singapore. And even when they travel, they do want to tune into CNA while overseas. But at the same time, we are creating content that reaches out to anyone and everyone. Because when you're online, when you're on YouTube, well, anyone and everyone can watch you. So the content isn't isolated or, or, or sort of a, a bound by physical boundaries anymore. Um, I won't say we're overloaded here. I think, well, in that sense, we're all overloaded by the kind of noise we get online, right? I mean, you can Google whatever term and, and there'll be numerous agencies telling you uh, their version of the story. So in that sense, uh, I think what we have in Singapore is, you know, it's just a, a kind of a pinch of, of the iceberg, uh, you know, and I, I, 
it's not overloaded, but it is a bit more Singapore centric simply because we realize most of our audience are here. I must ask one question if I can. Sensitive a bit. Media censorship is quite really prevalent across all of Asia, for every company Asia that, that I can think of, from mm -hmm. Myanmar to Malaysia to Hong Kong to everywhere. Do you feel restricted, Stephen, with what you can say or what you can't say in terms of media, media censorship? I don't feel restricted. I think we're just careful in how we approach certain issues. And I think that should be key for anyone anywhere in the world. Uh, obviously, Singapore um, is a very multiracial, multi-religious society. So when it comes to things that deal with those, we're just more careful in how we approach those subjects. Uh, I mean, I'm of the opinion that should I go cover an event, a riot, for example, a racial riot, uh, well, I won't even call it a racial riot, but a riot occurs, I go cover the event, how do I cover it? You know, uh, do I do it in a way that further stirs emotions and therefore causes more rioting? So yes, I got a great story, but the consequence of that was more rioting, more trouble in that sense. So I feel that we have a national duty and anywhere in the world as a journalist to report responsibly, not to stoke or, or create you know, uh, unnecessary emotional uh, tension simply because it seems like a good story. So, so in that sense, yeah, we are very careful. Writing shipping, how is writing articles, published author that you are recently, congratulations, all, all of these, if you like, print versions, how has that changed with the kind of advent of online digital explosion? Well, so obviously, uh, you know, I started out from a very, very much print background uh, in, in um, two magazines at the start of the decade, and then uh, more recently uh, with the Design Architecture magazine. But uh, even as even though I have left, you know, all three titles, I'm also watching them uh, gradually, or rather two of them have already transitioned fully online. Uh, at D plus A, we're a little bit slow on the uptake because for uh, architects, they still like to see their published projects in a print magazine. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it's definitely you know something that that has happened for most uh, print platform uh, print magazines in Singapore, um, and you know I always say that on the journalistic side, it's 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 quite challenging because uh, we went from writing maybe eight to ten stories per issue, i.e. a month, to now one story a day on average. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, uh, on the comm side, uh, they also, you also need to uh, appreciate that the load has just uh, basically increased threefold. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think, you know, we'll probably get into that a little bit more later on in the discussion. And how has how, how media engagement changed? You mentioned uh, in, in the past that it's very difficult to find some some c are saying that media engagement is quite intangible you can't really like gauge the kind of you know value going forward so what would you say to those who don't see the value of media at the moment or or, or indeed actually trust trust is a major issue right now of course mm -hmm. yeah so um this issue about you know whether uh the, the, the value of media engagement right basically i think that's what you're asking uh i think you know at least from where i sit uh in general um, from a magazine standpoint uh media coverage tends to be largely about uh, building brand awareness you know provided you are engaging the right outlets that target uh that, that your target audience are consuming so just also adding on earlier to what uh stephen uh stephen and Manisha were saying you know it's very important to know where your audience uh what your key messages are as well as where your audiences um, are consuming their content and make sure that when you convey that information it's out there um but largely you know it is still awareness uh building in magazines but what it does also is that it helps you build um, credibility because you know um, the, 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 these outlets you know talking about your brands help to uh, give you an endorsement by an independent third party. Um, with digitization, of course, this has changed. Uh, so brand awareness is, is um, or rather, you know, um, the ROI uh, return from, uh, from, uh, from a branding standpoint can actually become calculated now, especially if you do things like buy advertorials, for example, especially um, advertorials on the website, you know, or video advertorials on social, on social media platforms, absolutely everything is trackable now. Um, and so you can, you know, uh, 
ask for a report for the click-throughs and you can see, you know, what's happening. And from there, you can see, you know, the effect of, you know, uploading a post about a new sofa that you've launched. And then you can see how many people have um, uh, clicked through to, to, and to, to see, you know, uh, find out a little bit more about sofa, for example. Um, for some industries, the return is actually very, very immediate and obvious. So I'll just give you an example. I used to write a lot about for food. Uh, as a freelancer with a Today newspaper. And uh, I used to write, so, you know, when it still had a print edition, uh, I would write the story. And then the next day, for up to a week, the, out, the FMD outlet would be full. You have queues, you know, so you go overnight from an empty restaurant to something that's full, they're bursting, they can't cope. Uh, and uh, people actually, interestingly enough, actually ask exactly for the dishes that I write about. They bring the newspaper article and they say, okay, run exactly these dishes. You know, and uh, yeah, so it's 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 it really depends on where you're where where what kind of industry you're in. Um, but I'm not saying that food is a great industry, especially not in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's my two cents on this issue. I think I think behind all of that, of course, is for those for the, for those joining in, in in public relations or indeed business, pitching the story, calling up the journalist, sending a press release. I mean, what I mean, obviously, there are many. I've experienced it. Many frustrations. Dare I say it? Um, I'm now, I'm now, of course, in PR consultancy, but you know, I sort of know, having been a journalist in the newsroom, I know what not to do and what works. Almost writing the story for the journalist helps. Here's an exclusive, um, guaranteed CEO exclusive, but here's a great quote. It's why it matters. News hook, news hook, news hook. What other frustrations and what then adding to that in the shipping? What tips would you recommend to those watching that what you what you what what you don't do? Start with that one, because it happens. There are so many pitfalls, dare I say, it, of them. Do, and of course, they get angry themselves, but they don't get a reply from a journalist. They're so rude. They're so rude. But actually, they're not. They're just busy, dare I say. It. Yeah. So, um, OK, let's start with what you shouldn't do. I can do, see your right? smile is saying, yes, John, there are many frustrations. <laughs> yeah. Right. Everyone's <laughs> smiling. It's like we've all been there. Yeah. So from um, from a print from a print media outlet standpoint, right? And I think I, I guess also the broadcast guys also share the same issue. I think the, the 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 kind of most primary issue is sending sending a pitch that we don't honestly care about, and and this goes back to you know knowing your uh, target, knowing your um, the media outlet that you're pitching to, you know. So I think that's the first most important thing, and and it's obvious that they don't because you know for example, why should I care? that you, your firm uh, has a new CEO when I'm writing about design and architecture, right? It's, very, it's, it's as simple as that, uh, but this happens all the time. So knowing, knowing who you're writing to is extremely important. Um, you know, uh, another pet peeve of mine is um, asking to read the story before it gets published. You have no idea how many times I get that request. Uh, I understand, I mean, people tell me, oh, you know, because journalists get it wrong sometimes. But then my question back to you is, have you conveyed your key messages clearly so that we will understand you as well, right? So it's not just writing your key messages, but it's conveying them very, very clearly, right? Um, and it's through simple things like giving us examples, you know, less motherhood statements. Show, don't tell. Don't tell me that I have a great product. Tell me how it's great, right? So basically, why it matters news-wise, yeah. Yes, exactly, and because that would it, that would interest uh, our readers, who are ultimately your consumers, right? So, so um, uh, things like that. And then, if I want to move on to you know uh, what we want, right? Uh, really, at the end of the day, uh, from a magazine standpoint, what we're doing is we're really telling stories that even you would want to read yourself, right? So, if you 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 think that your own brand or your own product or your own service is not something that you would want to consume yourself. Uh, why are you pitching it to us, right? So we these are the stories that we are, that we want to tell, uh, what you will, would be interested in yourself as well. And what this means is really uh, timeliness, first and foremost. Why are you telling me this piece of information or news at this point in time, right? Um, original ideas, and we're always looking for emerging trends, paths less traveled, um, human interest stories. Um, I think I got so desperate when I was at D Plus A, uh, the design magazine, um, because this, you know, I just kept getting weird pictures all the time that I even um, had the team set up a uh, web page on our website to tell people how to get published on our platforms. And even then, they'd get it wrong. Can you imagine? What was your weirdest pitch? Come on, you're going to get or, or two or three. Give us one. Uh, um, 
we've all got them, right? <laughs> Steven's had a few, I can tell. Can I get back to you on that? I'm not well, very sure. You can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Steve, I, I, in, your, I in your experience, I, I think, I mean, just from Bloomberg, I've got, my experience is that a PR would set up a press release about something completely random, nothing to do with the news, and then call me maybe three days later after it already it's, it's passed the embargo and everything, and say, why don't you do that story? I'm like, well, please don't call them, I'm, I'm whatever. So that, that happened quite a lot because the, the, they rely on the press release. But to me, the press release follows the phone call. That's got the facts and right. details, right? Yeah. So, so I mean, shipping, yeah. it's a lot of it, as you rightly pointed out, has to do with that relationship. You know, it's getting to know my program, but getting to know me as well and getting to know what, you know, uh, sort of would interest me uh, enough to put it into the show. I mean, understanding the show is most important and, and which show you're pitching to. But yeah, I mean, it, it's hard because I know a lot of them have that pressure to have uh, a quantity as well to say I reached out to 50 companies and, you know, so many replied. So there's a lot of cut and paste. Uh, but it is true that if it's, if we can tell, we can all tell when it's a cut and paste job. So you generally don't read it. And a lot of times it's when someone follows up and says, hey, do you want to come check this out? I'm doing this thing and it's really interesting. And, and it's someone I know already who has described it in a way that makes me go, yeah, that sounds interesting. And then you can send that press release and everything else comes after because uh, as we all know, I mean, the hook is not the official formal statement. We know that's kind of there, but it's the other human interest, the part where um, you're telling your friend, a buddy over a beer saying, hey, we've got this really great thing that we're doing. You know why? Yeah, and, and that's, I think, what resonates better with people. And I mean, in your, in your, in your experience of pictures that you receive, Stephen, um, mm -hmm. without, without mentioning names, of course, what, what's the most extreme that you really you shouldn't be doing? People just call up and just really frustrate you, for example. And they, and they expect Actually, you to cover it. They expect no, it. No, I've been fortunate. People don't expect me to do anything. And I'm, I, <laughs> I don't know. And, uh, I haven't felt, ever felt pressured to do any of them. But I think also, in a sense, I've, we've crafted the show. So the main show that I do is Talking Point. It's a current affairs program which looks at many day-to-day uh, -day issues that people living in Singapore might come across. Um, so it's quite clear what kind of a program we are and when they pitch, usually they have that in mind. And if not, I just say, sorry guys, not interested, you know. Um, well, also because usually they just get the intern to go around calling, uh, excuse me, did you get our press release? Were you reading? So, <laughs> um, so that's also another giveaway. So I would go back to the fact that um, like with all the things we do in life, I mean, it is very much about the relationship you have with the journalists, you know, with the person that you're dealing with. And that sort of does uh, sort of, yeah, make a big difference in the greater scheme of things because I need to know you as a person before I start just opening up to you as a PR person, you know, and it takes a bit of effort. Uh, so I think it's, it works both ways. Manisha, to that point, I think building media relations is really vital, isn't it? Making the effort, knowing what they've written or broadcast, what they're doing, what they're passionate about. If someone's into health tech, for example, pitch to that. Don't pitch something completely random. So how important is that? And also your own experience, CNN, BBC, or people who pitch stories to you and you're going, oh my God, really? Or this is a fantastic pitch, yes, to that story. Yeah, okay, let me tell you. I think in my entire career, which spans more than 20 years, I personally have only ever responded to a PR, like a press release that dropped in my inbox once once and and I think it's worth yeah. sharing why I responded to it so it was actually when I was working here in Singapore for SPH radio and what happens is when you join the organization the whole PR industry in Singapore you know there's a press release that goes out that this new person has joined this is their email address etc so people knew that they could get in touch with me and so this press release drops and it's about an, a reinsurance conference okay let's be honest it's not the most exciting thing in the world reinsurance Fair enough, I was working for Money FM, so it's actually the platform where you might cover a story about reinsurance, but that doesn't really sell to, to the regular person on the street who most of our, our listeners were interested in, how do I invest in stocks effectively to make money and, and can retire on my earnings, right? That really is the, the primary focus for a lot of our listeners. Um, but I'm looking at this as a journalist and I'm saying, Actually, it's not the subject of this conference that I'm interested in. It's the people that they're bringing here to Singapore. So they had 
the CEOs of the biggest reinsurance companies in the world. And you and I, John, know how, and Stephen, all of us know how impactful those people would be. So I would always, having come from the BBC and CNN sort of global organizations, that's always where my pitch would be. It'd be like, well, I'm gonna talk about the conference, but I want that guy on the show because then we can say we had X number of CEOs on the show. That's a KPI for us because we're getting people who have that level of thought leadership and we're getting them to engage with our listeners. So that was major. We ended up having a guy on who is very deeply involved in insurance and climate. And it ended up being a really important conversation about adaptive economy given climate change. So we turned that into a story based on the guests who were coming rather than there's a conference, just we want to cover that. So, th so the PR had thought that that was the headline. I'm like, actually, no, look beyond. It's the people you're bringing. So I think, you know, we've had questions already about what advice would you give PR professionals? I'd say sometimes it's not actually the event. It's saying, well, we've got this person, this person. These are the things they can talk about. Lean into the zeitgeist because, you know, read, where do we get our inspiration as journalists? I can tell you hundreds of times where I'm sitting at CNN or the BBC and we're getting our inspiration from magazines that we're reading. You know, I remember when I was in New York and you might think, gosh, New York financial hub, all the rest of it. But in those days, we didn't get a huge amount of our news from digital. The years that I was there, we would we would go through The Economist and we would look at Time magazine and we would have a stack of magazines on my desk and I would read through all of them and see which articles were catching my eye, which subject areas, what are the things people are talking about? Where do we need to dig a little deeper? Where do we need to invite someone on to talk about this in one of our interviews on the show? So that was how I found stories. Um, again, I'm coming back to what I said earlier, which is it is a journey till you get to that point where you're able to broadcast to those hundreds of millions. So, so my first advice would be really think about what's going on. And I, you know, I agree completely with Stephen, like know what that show is about. If you, when you're going to pitch to them, you should have an idea of what sort of stories they cover in the first place and what they might be interested in. As for personal relationships, this is uh, about navigating the media. So let me help you navigate. Um, people like Shipping and actually Stephen are really important people because they're editors. So most of the time, me as an anchor, when I go on, on air. It's not me who's deciding what's in the rundown. Sometimes I would walk in and I would read the rundown and I'd say, you know what, guys, I think we're remiss not covering this. And I think that we need to do this. And, you know, I would weave them in. But by and large, I would respect what my editor had decided to put together. Now, some of that was us responding to stories that were dropping on Reuters on the day or assets that we at CNN or the BBC had direct access to. But sometimes it was stories that had been curated over time by our planning team. So who should you be reaching out to, particularly with organizations like CNBC, Bloomberg, CNN, BBC, you want to be hitting the planning teams, find out who those guys are, find out who the editors are, nurture those relationships, turn up, make sure they know who you are, make sure your name is in the back of their mind. Because when that big story comes up, where your firm, your company is relevant, they're going to call you because they're going to call in those assets and they're going to draw on those relationships. Um, so I hope that that's helpful because I think... It is helpful. I think I think to add to that as well, Manisha, is that yeah. not necessarily the CEO is the best spokesperson on television or in yes. broadcast. That person yes. may freeze up, may have a moment, we all have moments, but if a person is really eloquent, articulate, and has a great quote, stroke soundbite, the soundbite obviously carries throughout the day, a great quote in a newspaper can carry internationally with pickups, but I think I think it's that the best spokesperson, dare I say, is not the the head of the company. Maybe it's focus on that person, and if the CEO wants to speak, his him him or her. Obviously, media training is very important. You cannot go into interview with any any of these people on the screen. Yeah, and like yeah. rule. But it's going to backfire. I'll just add on to that because it's so true. I mean, I know for some of the PR firms is difficult because the CEO sometimes wants to be the one on, on TV. Yeah. So they're a little bit stuck. But yes, it could be the engineer who's designing the product. He could be the best person placed. And sometimes they may not be the most eloquent, but that sort of sincerity that comes across on screen is sometimes very powerful. So it's finding the right person, maybe having him with the CEO. I don't know. You've got to navigate that part, you know. Uh, but just to add on to what Manisha said earlier also about, you know, having the person come on. So, so yes, we want the key people. And, and I think don't be afraid that the C, so, so this guy, speaker you're bringing in from the reinsurance, for example, that she mentioned, we want him on air and don't feel like you don't 
that you shouldn't let him go on air if he's not going to talk about the company because by virtue of the fact that he's already there and people will know where he works, you know, so if he's that sort of senior. So I think it's not having to have that kind of in your face, this is my company. You know, sometimes they say, I want to have the company name right here. You know, that kind yeah. of very in your face branding is not as necessary in this day and age, I think. So find whatever yeah. footing you can get in the door and let your people, because as you're, if he's seen enough, he should know how to weave in. And by the way, at whatever company, we also do blah, 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 you know. On that, yeah. on that weaving in, sometimes they could be too over media trained. They could be bridging and bridging and bridging. Great, great question, John. Let me answer by talking about my new product. No, answer my question, please. I'll just keep asking. They can the same try. Question. I mean, that's again, what they're supposed again. to do, right? To try. <laughs> those, I mean, wait, on that, on that, John, doing can Zoom, I... Sorry, for those doing Zoom, the sun just came in my eye. This is a bad shot. Don't do this. Always check the sun. I was <laughs> done to shift mid Zoom, which is very frustrating. But there it is. You're glowing, move. John. You're just and glowing. I know. Well, it's just really, really annoying. So just try and get your lighting right. That's what I, anyway, sorry. Yeah. I, I just think. I was uh, going to say, actually, John, can I just come in on that on that point about you know it shouldn't be the CEO necessarily; it should be you know your best speaker. But I think I think it was you who had said this to us recently. Actually, um, in this day and age, a CEO should be adept at public communications. Yeah. That's got to be part of the job description these days because you are interacting on so many different platforms. And yes, we know a lot of, you know, whether they're MN MNCs or SMEs, we know that they have whole teams that are doing social media. These days, you can actually outsource all of your social media communications as an individual to a company that just specializes in making sure that you're, you know, you're on Hootsuite and every single one of the big platforms is being hit with your comments. So often it's not even coming from you, but it's vetted by you. We know that's happening. Happening. Um, so there is that. I mean, just as an example, at the Singapore FinTech Festival, we had people on stage who filled the auditorium in terms of their um, followings. And these were people who drew 7,000 people into a room who were not the former CEO of the company. That was the former CTO or someone like that. So that leans completely into what you were saying. It could be that person who is famous for developing that particular tech or whatever it might be. And they tend to be the much more interesting person in the room. The one other thing I wanted to say was, and, and actually, St Stephen, you made me think of this, you know, people who want their logo behind them or something like that, or they want to weave the name of the company in or something like that. Um, you know what? In the introduction, we've told everybody who you are and where you're from. And sometimes it can get to a point where if you get too overzealous. Yeah. If you get too overzealous with it, actually, it destroys your credibility. And, and actually, it destroys ours, too, because we're thinking it's our job to make sure you don't get away with that. But you're also making yourself look bad because it looks a little bit too desperate. You're here to talk to us in the capacity of a newsroom, certainly in my case. You're not here to talk to us. And even if it was a feature in a magazine, and, and Shoping, I'd really be interested to know what you think of this. You have to be very careful to walk the line to not undermine your own credibility. So that said, I... Um... Like, okay, yeah, I have also... Uh, uh, yes, so she because has a people... list of points, she has a list of frustrations. I can see it, right? <laughs> no, um, the, the, the thing that happens with uh, print or um, offline interviews or behind the scenes interviews is we have the comms people taking over the interview on behalf of the spokesperson. Um, I think you don't have that in broadcast, right? <laughs> so there was this one time, uh, there was this one time I did a, an interview with, it was about a project uh, with an architect. And I'm not kidding, the comms person took spoke half the interview for half the duration she's kept speaking. And it wasn't as if, you know, um, the, uh, uh, the the architect, you know, was not conversant in English or was not eloquent. She just decided that she had an opinion and she decided to take over the, the interview as well. And that was just incredibly um, annoying. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, in addition to, you know, ensuring that, uh, you know, your, your spokespersons are ready to face the media, uh, as a comms professional, it's also important to remember that you are secondary to the whole discussion. We want to hear what your spokesperson is saying, unless, of course, you are the one that's a spokesperson. But yeah, absolutely um, do not do that. There's a question actually here. Any tips for organizations new to the scene with little or no PR support on how to start building relationships with media and press? What would be some best practices to build connections and also credibility? an interesting one so how do you start from scratch i, I think yeah, it's already we just read their stories watch their news know what they like 
and then and then contact correct i mean and then here's a couple of stories that may be relevant to you you contact john dawson and he helps you no but i was going to say I, th I think um personal relationships are really good so the wonderful thing about single i think it's the glue to be honest so i think it's yeah. absolutely vital yeah. Um, the without wonderful it, thing we don't care, Singapore. we don't care. Yeah. And, and the great thing about Singapore is, um, and especially now, I mean, this is conference season, right? This is networking season. Go to all the events. Just go to any events that are relevant to your industry. Have that stack of business cards or your QR code ready to go on your phone for someone to scan. Go and meet people. There are media conferences. So one EFRA just happened here. Um, and then you have... Um, the, the big media conferences that will be happening, turn up and just talk to people. It is amazing what you can get done in Singapore and how these connections can then grow into these relationships. You know, attend things like this. We're always open and available. You can reach out to us through LinkedIn or whatever it might be. I think we're living in a world where it's much more possible. I think you, <laughs> I'm of an age, all of you are maybe younger. I'm of an older I'm age. There you go. <laughs> I have an age where that was really difficult. You know, these there, there were there were walls between journalists and people being able to actually reach us. But today, the information is out there. We have social networks like LinkedIn, for example. We have these sorts of opportunities that with which through which you can engage through Bridgeham, for example. So really, just need those contacts because it's going to help you in the long run. And I was also going to, um, I was going to add as well, right, this whole issue around how to build relationships with journalists. Um, I think it's it's also very important to, you know, um, get on the phone and call, uh, well, at least for me uh, in magazines, right, get on the phone, call, talk to us, um, even ask us out for a coffee or a, or a meal, right? Um, obviously, because I, I come from luxuries, uh, luxury, the luxury lifestyle background, so we were pampered like crazy. And, and after a while, you know, and, and that makes it does make a difference. I will not deny it, you know. Um, yeah, so that that's also I think something that you know what about what, what about so, shipping when sorry Stephen, carry on. I was gonna say for shipping now. So if you don't offer her a Michelin star meal, then forget about it. She's yeah, not they, even gonna bother. think about they you, you know, because the bar is up there. <laughs> Whereas for shipping, me, I love I'm how pretty you happy with the rest of us. We can have a <laughs> coffee at Starbucks. We're okay, shipping, you know. You to... I'm happy for a beer at the pub, you know, it couldn't give me a buzz, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I think I just want to add on that. Yeah, yeah, go it, ahead, it's, Steve. It's, no, I mean, so uh, sometimes I tell people, just find me online. And the way I see it, if you can't find me through my several social media platforms, then I'm sorry, it's not worthy of my time because it's so easy in this day and age. What, yeah, what yeah. about sometimes when journalists do not reply to emails or phone calls? Uh, it's just a bad journalist. It's just rude, I think. Well, I think so too. I think so too, because yeah, that happens to us uh, quite frequently. Um, okay, it depends. If you write, if you write, dear Stephen, and I know it's addressed to me, I will respond. If you just put, dear friend, or to whom it may concern, then yeah, forget about it. I'm not replying. And I think also, if you write a long email, I mean, it's unlikely they're going to respond. They're on deadlines. I, I think also, uh, from my experience in Bloomberg, all we cared about was the editor's love. That's it. So the editor loved my story, which, you know, occasionally might say, job, John, good job. But normally you don't get anything, which is good also. No word is good word. But I think that we're not working for, well, I'm not in PR, but the journalist is not working for your brand or you. They're working to please the editor, period. That's it. I think uh, at Bloomberg, we had this five Fs, you may know about, which was a story must, it's in my head like a chip. Um, it, a story must be the first word, the fastest word, the final word, the future word, and the most factual word. And some journalists, well, actually no social media, rush out a story without sourcing it properly so to hit all the five f's first word final word factual word fastest word future word which is spinning it forward it's a header it's a hard thing to do that so i think the pressure no one realizes behind the scenes a journalist comes in at maybe 3 a.m works till 4 p.m later on deadlines working over the weekend writing stories and the pressure's intense and i think there's been, there must be more empathy towards the pressures on journalists. They don't get paid a lot of money. They're, they, they're, they're trying to please the editor all the time. They're trying to beat their rivals, whether it's within the company or ex exterior rival press. In press conferences, they're always chasing the story to try and get the exclusive, which is which is Nirvana, let's face it. So I think that, I think that some PR don't empathize enough and understand the kind of logistics and the, what's happening during the day of a journalist. It's full on, isn't it? It's full on.
Um, on, another. On, on, on a, sorry, on a breaking news story, I think when you also have the, this happens quite a lot. It happened to me. So if the CEO or whoever is the guest has been brought on and said you got five minutes with Manisha or Steve or, or Shopping, right? And then suddenly it's breaking news, and you've only got one minute. They may come off and bollock the PR. I, t- I was told I had five minutes. I planned messaging. I'm going to ask the first question. Then I was going to go into my second message. This wasn't part of the plan. We prepared this. It's breaking news. It's live. It's radio or TV or whatever it is, right? Online. You've got to understand that the journalist may say, we'll come back to you. We've got to interrupt. I'm sorry. There was some breaking news coming in about a massive story. That's live. So I think you've got to understand that that's definitely happening. And don't beat up the PR people or indeed any, anyone because it's happened. It's just, that's just news. Sorry, carry on. Shipping. Yeah, no, so just, uh, rant. no, so just two points, right? To the, to your point about uh, um, stressed out journalists. Um, one, one, one thing that quite often happened to us uh, as well in, in magazines was we had PRs that send the press release via email. And then five minutes later, they'll call you and say, have you received it? <laughs> yeah, so it's very strange. I, I'm not sure why that happens. So absolutely do not do that. Um, and the other thing is, is, I guess it's the art of writing the pitch, right? How do you write um, um, good emails containing pictures that would attract our attention? Uh, I think we had a question around PR professionals uh, giving advice on how to introduce the organizations plus, doing a, plus do a press pitch. Yeah, so I think it goes back, uh, you know, well, at least with my team, for us, it's about storytelling, right? And it's, it, it's storytelling, I need to reiterate this, it's around timeliness, original ideas, emerging trends, you know, human interest stories, stuff that you would want to read about your organization yourself. And if you're not sure, go around and ask your network, your family members, your friends, ask them, do you think this is interesting? Because at the end of the day, this is who you're targeting as well, right? It's a very simple thing, yeah. Choice of words as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree with that. Actually, we've had another question. I mean, these are great questions. Um, please, please ask the questions for me. It helps me a lot. If pitched journalists with press releases or thought leadership articles that receive no response, what next steps would you suggest? How do we know if they're busy or just uninterested in our content? That's actually a really, really good practical question. I think if you know the email hasn't bounced back, you know it's reached one of our inboxes. Let me tell you that sometimes I would have I don't know, 300 emails in my inbox when I came in in the morning. Um, so I don't mean to be rude, but if I don't reply to yet another press release that's in my, you know, I'll go through all the sort of previews. Does, does that interest me? No, 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 no. You have to be that quick. Um, I think if you're not getting a response, you should perhaps have a thick skin and realize that there may realistically be no interest in it and go back to basics or find another way, which is try to reach us on a different on a different level. Um, these days, because our email inboxes have filters, you may find that it's not reaching us personally because it's going through a filter. And one of the reasons it's going through a filter is potentially that it has those words press release at the top. Now, there are some which are really important press releases. But, you know, if we're getting one that's coming from, let's say, the U.S. Embassy, and we know that Kamala Harris, so this actually happened for me. I knew Kamala Harris was going to be in Singapore. I had to make sure that all those press releases reached my inbox. So I make sure that those are not getting filtered to a particular place. But if it's a regular product launch or if it's something like that or another company announcement, it might not reach me even if it's going to get to my inbox. So I think you need to, you do need to be creative about finding other ways um, and, and just be ready for the bounce back. I know people find it really demoralizing but please it's not personal i promise i'm sure my other panelists will agree yeah i'll just add on that that for me the moment you put thought leader i'm kind of a bit mm, because <laughs> I, I don't know there's so many of these thought leaders and you know basically you're an expert in a certain field so in those cases usually when we need someone then we'll go looking for them we rarely interview people just for the sake of interviewing them so you may be an expert in this field, but if there's no new discovery in that field, nothing has recently happened in that field, then actually, no, I'm not interested in talking to that guy from that field. You know, so it is relevance. And so if you know 
uh, something's going to be happening in Singapore, there's a big event and you have that thought leader in that field, then pitch it at that time because that's in all likelihood a time when we'll be looking for experts to come on the show to talk about that event. But otherwise, you know, not really. So uh, for me, I, a lot of times the, the language also puts me off because it's so obviously, mm. well, lack of a better word, a bit of fluff to make it sound more powerful than it really is, you know. We're all smiling because we've had a question. <laughs> How is Stephen Char so intensely likable? Stephen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I won't let you answer that question. That, I have no idea. We've got to ask Stephen Char himself. I have no. I think no. I'm very grateful. Well, also, everyone else is as well. There you go. That guy. That's, that's still not, not me. Can I, can, I, can, I go in, can I go into the space he's of... He's the guy next door. That's why he's so likable. Yeah, the, guy, the, the guy with he's the a lovely face. smile. There you go. I, I, <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, guys. But I'm just, you know, Singapore... You're intensely likable, Steve. It's, it's, I'm just going to say. So, but yeah. Singapore is so small, right? So, I mean, I think... Um, and and I'm I'm very much Singaporean, so I think for a lot of my fellow Singaporeans, that resonates with them. I'm the dude you see at the coffee shop. I'm very regular, so in that sense, uh, so I think yeah, and it's great. And and I'm fortunate because our show also has has come to focus on many issues which are very day to day. Like we just did one about eating bread buns. You know, you go to the local bakery, you buy a bun for a dollar twenty, the floss bun, the the char siu bun, and. We all love those, but then, you know, how healthy are they really? So that's the kind of stories I do. So that's why when you send me a, a pitch about a thought leader, I'm thinking thought leader, buns, I don't know. How do I match these two? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, obviously, it's, you know, so if that pitch were reaching me at, say, BBC World or something like that, it could be totally appropriate. And that goes back to what we were all saying earlier is pitch to the appropriate person, program, appropriate story just think it through. I, I I used to get so many pictures that just didn't, they didn't make any sense given what we were covering. So yeah, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm going to I'm come to a Mike Rourke's question. I've been waiting patiently, but I must ask this last question. What would be your biggest turnoffs from organizations or PR looking to build relationships with press? I'd say don't hard sell me. That's a turnoff. That's, well, that's my version. What, what about yourselves? Biggest turnoffs from PR or companies? Shipping. No mission star dinner is a turn off. No mission star. I a beer, not enough. <laughs> Actually, for me, it's just uh, just be yeah. nice because there are some PR firms who have a bit of attitude and they think they're doing you a favor and kind of you know. So it's uh, that kind of it, it's again it's back to Empathy. the people skills because Empathy. it's the firm could have some really great PR staff, but you just need to meet that one specialist who is not so mm -hmm. nice, and then they've given that company name a, a bad name because you therefore may not be as kind to them in the future uh so yeah for me that's just, just be a nice person mike rock asked asked about 15 minutes ago the journalism being described sounds great however there appears to be almost word for word regurgitated pr releases across many fast news outlets very true is this diluting the value of journalism and in this example the value returned for companies I think good journalists wouldn't do that, Mike. For for style, I think I think I think you know regurgitate, which does happen a lot, copy and paste, but that that mm -hmm. isn't good journalism. So I think you I think target the good journalists who will definitely not do that. If Bloomberg, we probably get fired for that. You get absolutely bollocked. It would be not mm -hmm. a good day for journalists to do that. Correct, everybody. I mean, yeah. press yeah. also also press releases are they dead as well? Are they dead? I, I think to me it's a backup of detail mm -hmm. and facts. That's the mm -hmm. purpose nowadays. Yeah, in fact, I would say your press release is worthwhile. It's just not your first point of contact. Yeah. In fact, you can really yeah. turn us off by sending a press release. But actually, if you make a personal contact and then we say, well, that actually does sound quite interesting. Why don't you send me the info? That's the point at which I want to read a little bit more about that story. Uh, I mean, would the, you guys agree? No, yeah. For, yeah. for magazines, no, magazines, I mean, yeah. Um, for me, no. For, for Yeah, so far for me, no. The, the press release is still very valuable. It's... um. It's kind of the first line of uh, first line of contact for us. Yeah, mm, I'm not sure why because this is like thing. Why hmm? shipping? Why, why is it front line? Why is it the most uh, important? Yeah, because I think uh, it's, it's it's just the sheer volume of the the workload now. You know, so uh, for us, it's it, it's really a question of um, is how we it, it's where we get our information from now. Just because we have to be at our desk writing a lot of times. You know, um, I remember when I was with D plus A, I did not, um, because I had to push out all these stories so frequently, I didn't really have time to 
really go out there very much, even though I did, I did try to. And, you know, networking is absolutely a very, very important part of uh, the job, um, especially especially uh, for the editor, because it was important for me to get out there and find out what's happening at events, talk to the architects, know what the pain points are, try and make sure I represent them in the magazine. Uh, but yeah, that, 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 that amount of time dedicated to doing that was less because there was just so much keyboard pounding that needed to be done. And so um, the best way to get information to me um, back then was really through, the, through email and through the press release. Yeah, so, so there is definitely still value in it. And the question is, how do you write a good press release that attracts our attention? Yes. How to write a good press release. That is very important because some are not good. Yeah. Um, hire, hire John and shipping. That's it. That's yeah, hire John. And <laughs> <laughs> hire John into it. Yeah, it's it's back to that list that I keep that I've already uh, mentioned twice, right? It's it's I mean it's choice of words. Make sure you have I mean your basics in place. No grammar, punctuation, um, mistakes, actually, right? It just you tells know. a story, actually, just content yeah. rich, you know. I, again there was a quote I remember covering print at Bloomberg. That was markets. And I was 22 and I had to call up these fund managers to get quotes on the Friday afternoon story, the rap story. And New York was always watching this, what's called a Euro rap. And it was just so intense. I was a bit young and I was being this just full on. You know, and I, and this, I call up these, some of them just say, why are you calling me now? It's four o'clock in the afternoon. I've got time for you and hang out. But one guy said, and it was, a, it was the Asian financial crisis, 97. And he said, this market is like a cigarette packet it needs a health warning. I remember mm -hmm. thinking, hallelujah, because the quote mm -hmm. was so good. And then the headline, yeah. editor changed it to a you know, cigarette term, yeah, because yeah. It's on fire headline. And that mm -hmm. quote, that quote, my story was a good, okay, story is a market story, but that quote got me so much coverage, international pickups. And actually he told me that the next week that he got 50 million pounds of new investment because of, because of him being in the quote across all of these platforms back then so i think again the importance of knowing what to say i used to know a guy called justin lockhart stewart who's an ex-barrister he would spend a, an hour he got overexposed he's a lovely man overexposed red braces a character brilliant articulate speaker and he would spend an hour in the morning he would do he would create his quotes and his sound bites for bbc sky news itn bloomberg cnbc grow like gdp or retail high street whatever it was and he had a quote for everybody and you saw justin lockhart stewart's face everywhere I, I, everywhere and he, but he really thought about his strategy how do i approach the media that works for them as opposed to what works for me uh, can i just weave into this now the let me just trust. quickly share well, since yeah, you mentioned Stephen, yeah. i had one great quote too when we had a uh, in singapore the uh, uh pmds you know the the personal mobility devices the e-scooters they got banned overnight right so i i went to interview a guy who had a shop selling them and he he basically in the interview he said and just like thanos and he snapped his fingers. It's gone, <laughs> you know. Wow, that's a great quote. <laughs> because that was it was an overnight law that kicked in the next day, you know. So he was just everyone was blown away. But yeah, that was just uh, one of those great quotes that made the story. Can I can I extend on this part of the conversation actually yeah. about headlines? So, you know, I want to I want to appreciate the fact that not everyone who works in PR or the person who writes the press release is necessarily an expert on writing fantastic headlines. Um, so there are, it is worth going away and finding out how they do it, because sometimes that headline plus the first sentence might be the only thing we read, because it might be the one thing that comes up in our email preview. And if that headline is, you know, um, has okay. however many semicolons and colons in it, and it's three lines long, forget about it, it's not going to happen. Um, so, you know, one of the, sometimes with clients, one of the things I do is I say, okay, tell me what the story is. And I just wait to see what they're going to write down and what they're going to say. And we write it down as we go. And then if it's too long, I'll say, okay, now halve it. So it's this many words or it's this many sentences, now halve it. <gasps> what? How am I going to do that? Like, you're going to really think about what the story is. And then Hi, it's there you go. to cut it back, you know, until you get to that one punchy sentence, mm -hmm. which says it all. This is why, this is why I want to get your, your eyeballs right now. But be careful to not make it sound like clickbait because that's the new fight that we have that we don't want it looking that way and i have to say there are some <laughs> digital platforms out there that are very clickbaity and we've we have a, a problem with trust so you've got to be really careful about where you strike that balance on that point actually headlines 
PR go through a tough time sometimes with a CEO because if the headline is not really overly friendly because usually if the if the story is too friendly it's too pro brand or pro the company the editor said hang on a minute are you working for them or are you working for us give me the story i'm changing the headline i'm changing the first paragraph so if you write a too a positive story about the company that's going to backfire so i think i think understand the pr people that you can't you will not get a, a really friendly story because they're journalists you might get a balanced story, which is what you want. A negative story, obviously, you don't want, but a really friendly story is going to backfire. The editor is going to grab that one by the neck and say, no, 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 no. I'm changing this. This is way too pro them. So I think, I think be careful with that. On that word, trust, Manisha. So I think journalists have gone through, there's a lot of trust issues. This is a very important topic, I think. And I think my personal view is that there is more need now for the for us do i say it well-sourced experienced professional who understand the rules of engagement all of these like trained journalists than ever before thought stephen yeah. <laughs> what do you think because I, I just i just think the journalists are getting a bit of a bad rap um sorry sorry john can you I miss yeah, part I just of that. think that I think the, the trust issues with journalists, I think journalists are getting a bit okay. of a bad rap. I think, like, for example, top tier journalists yourselves, um, you know, we're experienced, we know the rules of engagement, we we source our stories, everything else. I think there's more room in the in the noise that in the, the huge yeah. noise, the information overload of the world right now, like Twitter, for example. A, a headline goes out, it's not sourced. There's more need for credible, good, well-sourced journalists. Right ever before in history that's my reasoning some yeah. might say absolutely wrong john but that's my theory because trust is an issue well definitely uh, so it's who do you trust but we we can't dictate that so that's so what one of the things i like to do now is i try to go to a lot of schools to to share a bit more about what we do and and you know how we look at information and it's the whole question of fact versus fiction and fake news and things like that so to have an understanding because as you rightly point out, there's so much noise out there, but we can't determine what people uh, choose to, to watch or to see. And of course, if you go into a Facebook group and you join this, it becomes an echo chamber. Therefore, you hear more of the same thing and your views get shaped by all that. So I think understanding how the platforms work, understanding their algorithms, understanding that whatever you see out there is never unintentional. The fact that you're buying, going shopping on Lazada or Shopee and that certain outdoor hiking gear keeps popping up is because, well, you clicked on it a few times, you know. So I think once we know that, then we kind of know who to trust and then decide. So, I mean, that's why I think certain organizations, you know, that we have all been with, I mean, I, I would never go work with certain organizations as well because that would be counterintuitive to, to my credibility. So it's a bit of everything. I don't have a, a straight answer in that respect. Manisha, trust? Yeah. Look, I used to, I, I work for CNN from time to time when I was in. So, you know, we know how polarized CNN is versus Fox News in the US. And then that raises these questions around, well, can we trust them because they come across as a very leftist organization? And can we trust them because they come across as a very right wing organization? I don't want to go into all of that stuff. I think the bigger issue for me is actually social media and what you were saying about the proliferation. You know, somebody can post something and, and it's believed the number of times from, and it's very interesting. And there are studies that bear this out. And maybe you'll all agree, I'm much more likely to get um, fake news from my 70 year old uncle because this has been sent to him a thousand times. And without thinking, he's trusting it in his innocence and he's sending it on to me. And the number of times on a family group chat, I've had to say, I'm really sorry to be the one to do this. But since I am a journalist, I'm going to tell you all that A, this is five years old. And B, there never was a fountain in China that when you say this particular mantra, it overflows. OK, so this is a real example of something that he sent me. And I said this was actually a company and it was sponsored and it happened five years ago. So this is not news. This is not special. This is not some mystical thing. But, you know, my uncle's a really spiritual, religious man. To him, it meant so much. And I had to burst the bubble. Um, but there's a lot of that kind of stuff around, which is far worse. The pandemic, 
think about what was going around during the pandemic. That was tough for us as journalists to be able to wade through the noise and try to help people say, look, if you're not hearing it from the government, don't trust it. In, my, in our school, we had WhatsApp groups, which are now dis discouraged, but people were sharing all kinds of information. And as a journalist who was who would see the press releases coming out before they were going on air, I'm like, where are you getting this information from? And on top of that, you're irresponsibly sharing it. So you're sort of sit leaning in to your friends and saying, we all have to be responsible about the kind of information that we share. Um, I think we must not forget, as we're talking about navigating the media, the younger generation, they're getting news from TikTok. They're getting news on YouTube. They're getting it on all of these different platforms. And I think more than ever, I mean, we all don't know what Elon Musk is going to do with Twitter exactly. There are some people who have some theories, but this whole blue tick thing, I'm watching it very closely. This idea that these are organizations that are somehow more trustworthy or the bastions of truth or whatever, well, who's truth? So this is a new kind of, post. this is the post-truth world where we have to have these debates about what is truth. I can tell you, having worked for the BBC, CNN and Reuters, I have worked alongside some of the most talented, brilliant, responsible, caring people in the world who take what they do really seriously and they approach their journalism with the highest level of ethics in mind. And they double source, they triple source. Um, and I would trust them in a heartbeat. And yeah. I hope many others would too. That's well, what I have to say about that. Well said, I couldn't agree. Um, Andrew Clark's got a question here. What's the best way, Andrew says, to check the credibility of a journalist who might reach out to you or your company for an interview or comment? I think that's the point to you, Manisha. I think, you know, these are seasoned people who, I agree with you, I've worked with some really talented people who take it so seriously. And if the question was, that's not, that's not trustworthy, they, they really take it to heart. It's a real insult. But I mean, to, to, to Andrew's point, I mean, how do you check the credibility of a journalist? Yeah, well, you know what? There are no. so many ways you can do that today because you can, <laughs> I mean, companies do this now. When you apply for a job and there are, there are actually companies that do this, this is their business, they trawl social media to see how credible this person is. So that is one thing you can do. You can look them up on LinkedIn. I would say counter interview them, ask them, who are you? Can I see some of your past work? Who have you been talking to? Which organizations do you work for? Singapore is such a place where everybody knows everybody. So, <laughs> so there's always, you cannot there's hide. always someone you can call on and you can say, hey, do you know this person? And you know they might be able to tell you. Um, but this is this is a great time where that's a great question and you can definitely leverage you know linkedin or whatever it might be and i would just say be honest just say look in this world where it's very difficult to know who to trust i would love for you to tell me and show me examples of your work you know given the fact that you're in, you want to engage with me so it goes both ways andrew said i trust all of you thank you andrew he's a good guy andrew clark um can i, can I just shift in if i can uh Stephen's mentioned schools, you mentioned TikTok. I know that kids do consume, literally, I'd say 85% of their news from TikTok or other areas like that. Now, you know, Manisha, on, on the call now is um, the PR from Dulwich and Marlborough, and your kids at Marlborough, sorry, Dulwich, excuse me. And yes. I know that you went to a recent uh, talk, what was it called? Um, a compassionate systems model. You, you were quite impressed without pushing the Dulwich story, which I'm sure that the person on the live from PR would love that. Um, but I think, you know, trying to filter and protect and regulate media for, our, for for the next generation, for kids, for our kids, it's a it's a big challenge because they are just consuming. And even though we can at home try and uh, regulate our own, what, what, what they read and see and watch, they're with their friends. Whatever we think that we're, we're covering, they're already telling us not what they're, what they're actually seeing. So it's very difficult to, to manage it and control that. So how, what did you hear from this? talk Manisha that was groundbreaking if you like yeah well to clarify the talk was actually about it was to help us parents understand the system within, within which or the, or the system that sort of underpins the way that Dulwich engages with our kids and, and interacts and teaches our children and it's called this compassionate systems model so what is that really well um, the, our brilliant presenters that day started the session by showing us a bunch of headlines and saying, well, these are all, and they were all really negative headlines. It's like, you know, the world is burning, it's all falling apart, you know, everything was just negative. And it was from that day. Um, 
And I've said this for years, if you go through, and I did actually do this once, it was a litmus test. I got the Times newspaper when I was in the UK, got a marker pen, and I marked the first story headline that was positive in any way. It took me till page six of a broadsheet to find a small article to put a loop around that headline. So there is so much negativity that our children are being bombarded with. And then if it's negativity in the actual news, then over on social media, well, there's all kinds of stuff. And those are other different people's energies, wherever those people are at, broadcasting to our children and our children are downloading this stuff. So what was this course all about? It was about how do we help our children become more resilient in a world where all of this is happening, where they're being bombarded with this type of negativity and news, because it can put them in a state of fear and overwhelm. I can tell you a personal story. My son, who is 12, can't stand talking about climate change. He says, I can't address it. It's so depressing because that's how it's been sold to him in the media. Um, and I think we've we've got to we've got to do something about this. You know, we've, it's got to be solutions focused and more positive and all the rest of it, but not in a way that glazes over what the problem is. So so there's that. That was the engagement with school, which I thought, by the way, was brilliant because I really worry about the world that my children are growing up in. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say um, was around there are movements now that are focusing on positivity and news and why it's important and why it's an ethical choice, a moral choice. Um, I've engaged with organizations in the UK that do it. They go out to the likes of the Telegraph and the Guardian and they're actually training newsroom teams to be more conscious, to be more aware about how they're writing. And why do I think it's important in this context is perhaps that's what PR and comms departments also wanna think about, really solutions focused, compassionate approach in a world in which we're all facing noise and, and it is causing a mental health crisis. Yeah. Stephen, can I just go to add one thing? Juliet Wolf quite rightly says, corrected me, compassionate systems is actually for everybody, not just Dulwich College. So they're always, they're always showing it, so it's, it's across the board, but I think it's a very, it's a wonderful initiative, it really is. Stephen, share that shipping. What do you think about the next generation just filtering regulating the news it is it is it is an avalanche of pretty unhealthy mental health issues as well i mean it, it is a challenge and i think you know i have two young kids the same thing it's what do i want them to see or hear you know in a way and and i've come to the point where i know i can't control like restricting it and saying less screen time those things are effective to a certain point but i think it's more about having them understand and, and uh, understanding that what they're seeing isn't always fully accurate or reflective of uh, real life, you know. So they have to come to the maturity and, and know that while they're growing up in this world full of noise and everything's going to be digital, even more so. Uh, so I, I think, yeah, having perhaps as role models as parents, this is something we can do to, to better encourage them where I think very much our Asian society tends to stay less, just restrict them, less screen time, less opportunities to use the phone. But I don't think that's going to work in the long run because I, I also don't want them to lose out in the real world later on where everything is on those platforms. So it's again, having to have the maturity to look at something, to understand and know that, okay, maybe this isn't the best story. Let me read three other versions of the same story and therefore then based on that, make some kind of a decision. So that's what I try and do with the kids. Shipping? Yeah, no, I'm, I don't have kids, but yeah, I think uh, what both Stephen and Manisha are saying are, are correct. And I think it's, it's, also, it's also very important to have, I would imagine as a parent to have these direct conversations, talk to your kids as much as possible, right? Because uh, yeah, while they are engaging on, with screen time, this you know it's it's important to make an effort to talk to them to explain what's happening and maybe even redirect some of the content that they're reading. Right, lifestyle is great. <laughs> there's a lot of very positive. <laughs> yeah, quite right. If you can afford the Michelin star restaurants, you know, so the rest of, for the rest of us, or, or get gifts. To be fair. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. So interestingly, also just just to, as a, as a site point um, when I was covering you know architecture um, this issue of uh, uh, you know empathy and compassionate um, uh, kind of what do you call it user experience design 
is something that has come up a lot. And I also started to see in the last four years, um, conversations by architects shifting even within the built environment towards talking about building for the end user, designing spaces that are user friendly, right? And I used to ask them, I said, isn't this something that you should be doing anyway? Um, but yeah, for some reason, this issue is just, is, is only coming up front and center now, you know, um, well-being, how do you make buildings that are, uh, uh, how do you design buildings that are catered to? But, but, that, but that being said, I think we are fortunate because now there is a lot more positivity or positive news going around simply because there's so many platforms. In the past, if you had one news bulletin and you only had 30 minutes, then of course all the bad news went in because that was, those were the top stories. But now you've got so many other platforms. So, you know, like we have CNA Lifestyle, we have so many other platforms which are just all good, happy, fun stuff you know um so it's not all doom and gloom after all do you think yeah. do you think it's unfair to say that journalists tend to like negative stories because we're a bit cynical so i think the journalists <laughs> i mean i mean the negative story does get headlines and let's face it it's i mean the good stories are often the kind of you know kick when, when and, and when finally else? a dog was pull up a tree and someone say the yeah. dog but when know, else that. would you have breaking news you wouldn't have breaking news of Woohoo, pokemon opens a new <laughs> exhibition at the i mean <laughs> you know so unfortunately, yeah. because breaking news is generally bad news. Well, on that, on that, so there, there was this epic week that I had anchoring for CNN in London. It was 20, I think it was 2015, something like that. Uh, yeah, something like that. And we had literally breaking news every week. Actually, maybe it wasn't 2015, maybe it was 2011. I don't know. I think I've got all of my dates mixed up. But anyway, it was CNN the week has that breaking the news all the time. <laughs> it was, well, yes, you are, you are the, 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 <laughs> The bastard of breaking story. news, Manisha. But, um, it was the Pope resigning. It was Pope Benedict resigning. And so it was sort of neither, it was just an unprecedented. So there is the unprecedented story, which is so remarkable. And that's so weak. So that week was crazy. We had one day where Oscar Pistorius shot his girlfriend, which was a terribly sad story. Mm -hmm. That same week, Pope Benedict resigned. That same week, and this was a rem remarkable story and it actually made the headlines and we covered it for hours. There was a huge asteroid that streaked across Southern Russia and blew out cities as it went by. It was, it was just for a television outfit, it was the pictures, right? So it's sometimes we're driven by different aspects of news, particularly in, with CNN, pictures are a really big deal. You know, the BBC was a bit more kind of on the academic side, but CNN was very much about the picture tells the story. Um, and, you know, these big unprecedented events would get hours and hours of coverage. Um, but I mean, I just want to, given everything everybody said, there's a question from, from Juliet, which was, as I recall, former BBC presenter Martin Lewis tried to share a message of news positivity years ago, but was unfortunately ridiculed at the time. I totally agree with Stephen. Today, there is so many opportunity, so much opportunity to share the more positive stories. You know, in those days, we used to call it the kicker. So you would do oh, 25 minutes, and finally. 20 minutes. Of yeah, and it was your and finally your kicker story, and it would cat be that one. Up a tree, oh. a, a, a <laughs> ten-year-old rescued the cat is a hero, and this is an amazing yeah. story. And it's a lovely story, and ever, that's that's yeah. the and finally story. You never lead with a good story, well, rarely, very rare. But I now, think. if you if you look at say the BBC News website, so the, true story. This week, I was looking at the BBC website as um, COP twenty seven kicked off. And uh, the UN Secretary General had announced we we're all on the road to hell, which was a horrible, scary headline. And, you know, if you log into the BBC, you can see all the stories that the BBC think is, think is important because they're sort of listed in, in, in order of importance. And then there's a tab that is, what are the most read stories? So when I clicked on the most read stories, that story about being on the road to hell wasn't on the list. Good. And there were 10 stories. And in fact, the second story was about a woman who's decided to give up on Instagram. Well, that's, so that's, the world the has changed. Red stories, that's, that's even better because that's what they're like, reading, obviously. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting little experiment. I mean, do it from time to time if you want to get a sense of what people are picking up on. And that actually brings me to another point that I, I don't want to go on said all the way back to what Sherpeng was saying earlier about data. We have more data available to us than ever before that mm. tracks who's watching what, who's going where, who's going to which story. It used to be that our television coverage at CNN used to feed the digital coverage. Now digital is feeding through to TV. It's going the other way. So there is all of this sort of uh, cross-pollination that takes place, but it's also driven by a lot of knowledge about what people are actually reading. But as 
editors do have to rise above that because sometimes we have to set the agenda. You know, sometimes it is important that that massive climate change story has to be number one. Um, and this is where the ethics and the responsibility kick in, and that's a whole different thing. John, can I answer a question that I've been Please, I'm also conscious of time. We've gone over our hour, but that's great. It's a great debate. It's a great conversation, to be honest. So we've got like 10 minutes left. So let's let's go through these questions. Go for it. You take over. I'm gonna take <laughs> I don't want to Alicia, take over. Anchor for CNN. I will just do this and I will relax and let it real speak. Um, so it's from Aditi. And the question is, would you have any suggestions on how to approach media in other countries while reaching out from Singapore? So actually, this has been something that's come up time and time again. Um, I have friends, for example, who used to run the Singapore Film Festival. And one of the things they really struggled with was letting for, you know, the likes of CNN and the BBC know that they were bringing in these really big directors and that they were showcasing Singaporean talent. And it's a wonderful space to celebrate, right? but very difficult to reach these, reach these organizations. I think I'll just go back to what I said before. Um, do your research, find out who the, for example, at CNN, it will be the director of coverage. That's the person who you want to reach and you can find out who these people are through LinkedIn, through your networks, talk to people, um, try to find the right editors for the right shows that cover your stories. And it's increasingly easy in this day and age to, to reach those people. Um, and then, you know, use networks like Britcham or whatever else it might be to just mm. talk to people, ask those questions. Um, it is it is tough, but once you have those email addresses, once you have those numbers, once you can connect on LinkedIn or whatever it might be with a good pitch, because you've listened to our panelists and you know um, what would be the best approach. Um, today, there are just, just a plethora of ways to reach them. But just try, don't be intimidated by the fact that they're out there. Um, more often than not, it's great when they have, particularly the digital teams, are always looking for great stories. TV is a lot harder because we have a lot less airtime for you to feed into. But digital, there's just so much opportunity. I think as Stephen said before, I mean, there's no excuse not, not to contact any, any of you because there are so many opportunities. But, you know, uh, Stephen, at CNA, who is the best person to pitch a story to? Would it be you? Would it be the head of booking guests? It, it all depends because we all work on different programs and different different platforms, the digital teams doing different stuff. So I don't even know what some of the other guys are doing. So I can't give you a straight answer. So it depends on what your story is. Then go and search and see which would be the program or the platform that you think would be best suited and find out who's behind it. It shouldn't because as, you, as we all said, there's always a byline. It's always a stop produced by so-and-so. So if you can find that name and just kind of Google them, you should be able to find the person. But I'm happy, yeah. But it, it, usually, if people send me stuff, I'll just I'll try if I can to redirect it to the people that I think are relevant. But again, it, it all depends on well how many I get on that day, and if it's a slow day, then you, you might get lucky. And and if it's a really long email like that, you're gonna read all through that. If, if it goes, if it's, if it's three paragraphs max, I think I think rule two paragraphs. Here's a pitch. Love to yeah. talk to you about it. Quick, as you said, two sentences. That's really hookable. And then, okay, I'm interested. Let's have a chat. But call me yeah. not during uh, on air time. Don't call me at like just, 10 a.m. in the middle of a show. I'm not going to reply. I, I'll just jump in also and respond to one of the yeah, questions please. about using buzzwords in a press release. So, uh, again, I would say no, because I think at the end of the day, yeah, you just want to keep it simple. If I don't even understand what I'm reading as a journalist in your press release, then good luck with you know getting everybody else to understand it. So, a lot of times when I do media training, it's about getting the really smart guys who know their stuff really well to speak in a way that all of us can understand that i think is the most difficult hurdle for most of them well, on that media train this sorry shipping yeah yeah no i just wanted to jump in about the issue of um uh knowing who to contact right uh, i'm not i don't work for them but there's this platform called talent media in singapore and from what I understood from um, the PR community, it's been quite invaluable. So yeah, absolutely sign up for an account. And I think they are very updated on who is doing what in which uh, media outlet. Yeah. What's that? What's that? How do you, how do you? Tell them. Tell them. Yeah. Tell them is exceptional. So, you know, Mike Webster's uh, behind that. And you got, you got Nick in, in Asia, head of Asia. I mean, I use that a lot. They, they're unbelievable. They send weekly mm -hmm. updates, every journalist move, even PR move. You can announce over it. They've got an incredible database. Um, I, yeah, I, I so agree no with you. Excuse. Probably the, it's yeah. the best in Asia. No excuse. By far. Yeah. By far. Yeah. No, it's a no excuse. No excuse no for not knowing because who because and, and even if you're not paying subscription, which they want you to, obviously, because that's the money makes the world go round, they're happy to help and say, look, you know, we don't really that, but 
we can help you on this occasion. That they've, I mean, I hate to say it, but not to say it, say it. I, I, I love to say it. They're a wonderful team of people, and they've I've known them for eleven years in Hong Kong, and it's just been. Yeah, they, uh, they even um, they even helped pluck my my book that came out recently. They did absolutely didn't have to. I emailed them about your book, by the way. Which, by the way, can you mention your book? <laughs> no, I emailed Nick about your book, so I'm just going to oh, give myself did? a tiny bit because Nick put it out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, because well, I. Yeah, I've heard about your book. book. Your book that you spent ten years on with with Leanne Sim, who's a great yes, friend. Thank you. So let, let's hear about the book, and then we're gonna we're gonna wrap it. Okay. We'll have, we'll have to hear about like the book. One one minute pitch, right? Okay. The labor so, of love. Yeah. So for me, it was a year and a half. Uh, but for Leanne, okay. Anyway, the the, the book is called Sim Kibun, the businessman bureaucrat, and this gentleman is he was basically the head of the civil service in Singapore. Um, for five years, but his biggest, uh, he's most well known for overseeing the development of Changi Airport uh, when it shifted from Pai Leba to Changi. And he laid the groundwork for a lot of the uh, uh, um, user experience and the, the service, uh, the service experience and the, um, uh, the kind of interior design of the, of the airport. Or as we know it to be uh, today, and it's award-winning status, a lot of it attributed to him. So that was a book that I worked on for the past one and a half years. We interviewed, I interviewed 47 people, uh, his colleagues and his, uh, the people that worked under him. Uh, and then uh, it was co-authored as well by his granddaughter. So she wrote three, uh, three chapters, three out of the nine chapters, giving a very personal uh, take on who he was um, as a man privately and within the family. Um, and yeah, it debuted at uh, number one on the bestseller nonfiction list. <laughs> Thank and, and you. I've read it and it's a very good book. And it's interesting that actually, anecdote, at the airport, he was obsessed by the toilets. Yes. Wasn't he? Yes. That's, what, that's something that you famous. Yes. True story, correct, Shippi? Absolutely true. Himself. He walked in every time he went and said, if it wasn't clean, what's going on there? So it was yes. spotless all the time. The plants are all him. Yes. Um, I mean... Since then, I mean, is it is it the same as it? Uh, no comment. Was it, are the toilets <laughs> clean, but he was so detail oriented, wasn't he? He was so focused, and he grew up in a, a, a slightly a poor part of Singapore back in the day. And I think you know, Leanne always says that her dad got a bit of I, I got a bit of a tough tough upbringing because he was a pretty tough bloke. I mean, he had an amazing. He never ever lost his temper. He was very calm under pressure, but he. One of the architects of modern Singapore, without without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, a close close associate of the Kuan Yu's, and uh, yeah, I know absolutely somebody who deserved to have a book uh, written about him because he was just so unknown. And I hope that you know this book will be read as well by the future generation, the younger generations of Singaporeans, so that we know where we came from. And yeah, I think we should do a webinar on it, Brit Chan people. <laughs> I think there's a good, there's a good um, right I think a webinar on it. With, with Leanne, it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. For her, it was 10 years, obviously all her life, but 10 years of starting. I think her, her father said, you know what? I don't really want to do this book because it brings up a lot of stuff for me, but actually I think I think we should. I think we should. And oh, I it think started it's, in a it's been quite cathartic, like a isn't it? Because you've had a few, you've had a few in-person, uh, sorry, I learned this recently at a summit, IRL in real life, not in-person, IRL summits or events like, you know, Singapore FinTech. And I think that the, the it's for the family, it's quite for the five brothers, and it's five brothers. Mm. Cathartic. Yeah. They've all talked about it, open up about it. So I think it's been a very powerful because story. he was so dedicated to helping to build the country. Yeah. That was that was one of his key focuses. So but you know, parenting super strict and strict at home, super strict. Yes, yeah. You know, yeah. that's 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 what that's, most fathers yeah. did, done, to be honest. It's what the generation was, yeah, exactly. Um Thought leader, quick ones, just why did the word thought leader ever emerge? What's wrong with expert in? Any leader who calls himself a thought leader should not be a leader. There you go. Um, thank you, Mike Rourke. Not a question. However, I wanted to say this has been one of my favorite and informative chamber sessions this year. We love you, Mike Rourke. Thank you to the panelists. So I, actually, I'm going to wrap up by saying thank you to panelists. We've gone over such an hour and a half now. So those who are watching, uh, I'll try to keep it to an hour. But thank you very much to all of you for being really candid, very open, thoughtful, insightful about your your thoughts and experiences, and hopefully everyone got some great advice. And thank you to all those actually also who attended and joined us and for your questions, they were fantastic. Um, I'd like to also highlight, if I can, reading off my written auto cue here, the next in-person event where we also look to the future, albeit in the metaverse, 
Andrew Clark knows about that. You can see the details on your screen now. So it's called Unreal Estate, Demystifying the Metaverse. This will be next Tuesday, November the 15th at 5 p.m. The world of Web3 is embracing gaming more and more. This is the future, whether older generations like it or not. Our speakers will share the opportunities and pitfalls the metaverse pose to business and real estate. Please refer to the BritCham website for more updates on future webinars and the Chamber's events, virtual or IRL in real life. I'm proud of that new acronym. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You'll also receive a feedback form. Please do fill in and feel free to be honest, good or bad. Uh, fill that in and help the Chamber understand what you would like to hear more of and how today's session went. And just to say, actually, on the metaverse, I had a recent thing at a web summit in Lisbon. The metaverse, a woman, uh, this lady gave a great speech that whether you like it or not, everybody, our children are playing Roblox. And it's not all about shooting people. Like girls, like, uh, my daughter's 13. She loves building houses on the metaverse. And then, you know, Stephen comes in. I built you a room, Stephen, in my house. And this is fantastic. And you're going to have these little flowers. You're going to have a whole restaurant shipment. You're going to have that little over there. You're going to have this shipping. So the girls love building houses. It's, it's become a community. I learned that Web3 is actually 95% gaming. You know, or, you know, think about Metaverse is Web3 and Metaverse is more or less gaming, which, of course, I don't do. But that's the next generation. So we have to embrace, engage and but everybody, thank you so much, honestly, for taking your time today. I know it's busy for everybody. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, have a wonderful evening in Singapore, the Lion City. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.